Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Once only a staple of American politics and of a few Western countries, think tanks have gained popularity worldwide for their role as policy advisors. South Korea is no exception, and the past years have seen the establishment of a number of institutions in Seoul, such as the Asan Institute and the East Asia Institute. While think tanks provide extensive research and useful advice to policymakers, critics have started to call into question their independence, their integrity, and their usefulness. One of these critics is Professor Emmanuel Pastreich, who argued in a recent article that think tanks suffer from a number of shortcomings. At the same time, he asserted that Korea, and specifically Seoul, has the potential to become a hub for think tanks in East Asia. We sat down with him to discuss the ideological biases of think tanks, the inaccessibility to wider public of their debate, and the need to include the youth in the policy process. Professor Pastreich is an associate professor at Kyungi University in Seoul. He received a BA in Chinese from Yale University, an MA in Comparative Literature from the University of Tokyo, and a PhD in East Asian Studies from Harvard University. He taught previously at the University of Illinois and George Washington University. In 2007, he established the Seoul-based think tank The Asia Institute, has advised regional government in Korea, and published a number of studies in technology, the environment, and international relations in multiple languages. Professor Pastreich, uh, welcome to Korea in the World. Uh, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> What brought you to Korea? My original field was Japanese studies, and I did originally classical literature, so I started with uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese novels of the 18th century. But the specific in 2007, Uh, I was given this very appealing offer to both teach at a university uh, and be advisor to the then governor of uh, Chungnam province. So uh, uh, I came here in that capacity. First worked a lot with local government, but increasingly I moved back to being a, a full-time professor. Uh, you also publish in the media. You run the uh, Asia, Asia Institute and you participate frequently in, in public events. What pushes you be beyond the academic ivory tower? It started in the United States. I'm an American, and uh, in the United States, we have a very serious problem that policymakers know so very little about Asia. However, the large number of Asia experts tend to be in their, their confines, not really engaged in a public discourse. So back when I was at University of Illinois, now 15 years ago, uh, I started to write for a general audience, and I, I just felt compelled that Asia has become so important for the United States and, and for Europe, uh, and yet we have so little understanding about the daily functioning in an in institutional, political sense. So I felt a real need to engage outside of the university, and that's only grown. Hmm. A few weeks ago, you wrote an article on think tanks and the culture of public discourse. Um, before we get into the topic, we'd like to take up uh, your premise. As you wrote in the first sentence of the article, governance is perhaps the greatest crisis we face today. What do you mean by governance in this context, and why is there a crisis? There are multiple aspects to the, to the crisis, and governance refers both to government, per se, and also uh, corporations. There tends to be an enormous hollowing out that the government is increasingly becoming a paper tiger, it doesn't really function properly. We see that most profoundly here in Korea in recent days. And uh, we have also found that technological change has meant that people are linked together, whether it's by Facebook or other internet formats, in new uh, paradigms for cooperation and exchange. And globalization means mm -hmm. in a way that we have these enormous global players in multiple uh, worlds, uh, in both in terms of uh, incorporations, in terms of government institutions, in terms of military security, which don't really conform with any of our previous nation state, uh, not to say nation states have disappeared, but there are these other actors. And so uh, it's increasingly a, a serious, serious issue. Uh, and to sort of talk about East Asia in terms of, well, China, Japan, Korea are going to do this, or the United States are going to do this, when each of these names actually is made up of increasingly fragmented competing entities, uh, uh, there's a major gap between what there actually is and the words that we, this is Confucianism, mm. right? <laughs> you have to rectify the names. What you're talking about has to actually represent what institutions really are. And as long as there's a gap, uh, if there's a serious gap, then it, it essentially paralyzes just about everything. Uh, you said the governance crisis is uh, quite strong in Korea. Why is it the case and is there something specific 
to Korea in that regard. I don't want to get into a comparative governance crisis mm. analysis because uh, I haven't done my homework. I'm living in Korea, so I'm most aware of Korea, whether it's of the Sewol ferry sinking or the recent uh, mayor's uh, uh, Middle East uh, respiratory uh, syndrome crisis. We seem to have some serious issues in terms of how we govern, both how government uh, administers, how we define the common good, and also for corporations, because of course, Part of the crisis of governance has to do with the process of privatization, the outsourcing to uh, companies, and the question of what the vision of companies is. A hmm. And this is linked, of course, to the dependency on a uh, financial financialization of all things. To say the, the way we address issues is by figuring out how much they cost and then figuring out it, uh, according to that logic. Uh, that's an enormous breakdown. And I mean, for example, if we have merits, I was struck by this. The first discussion is we should lower the interest rate, right? So I thought of a lot of things that had to be done. Lowering the interest rate was not on the top hundred of things I thought that we had to do in response to merits, but it became very obvious. It was like yeah. almost, you know, accepted practice. That means that governance is being defined in an extremely narrow sense. Hmm. That's not Korea per se. I mean, I, I see this around the world, but it's a, it's a serious issue. So to govern well or, or better, you need good ideas. And this is where think tanks and other institutes uh, come in play. How could they potentially contribute to a solution uh, to this governance crisis? I'm not promising. I think the problems are profound and they, they have cultural and ideological uh, roots that have to do with the sort of the, the decay of the previous Cold War system and some ambiguities, ideological ambiguities. There is the potential that you can try out new approaches to governance within the context of think tanks. And increasingly, think tanks are the only place, not the only place, but they, they're the most active and dynamic location for discussions mm -hmm. about policy, but also for experiments in terms of governance. Uh, so I, I think they do have that potential. I'm not, by the way, here to sell think tanks, per se. Mm. And I think there's a little, been a lot of danger uh, with think tanks around the world that they tend to be extremely well-funded with particular agendas and that good governance is not necessarily uh, the purpose of all think tanks. But it could be <laughs> a purpose of think tanks. You criticize that most think tanks do not promote open debate, but rather explain an agenda that has already been decided. What, yes. do you, what do you mean by that, and, and whose agendas are we talking about? Well, of course, different think tanks are funded by different uh, groups. The basic two assumptions we should start with are, one, follow the money, and two, uh, who benefits, right? And if we, if we use that sort of calculus, we can often uh, get a pretty good idea. So there, there, there has been a tendency... Maybe I'll talk about the United States because uh, mm. it's where I started. Uh, I could talk about Korea as well. Uh, but there are think tanks which are very heavily funded with particular agendas in terms of, say, seeing the world in terms of uh, traditional security structures and securities defined in terms of uh, tanks and uh, aircraft carriers, et cetera, missile defense. So th that would be a, a very, uh, I think, very dangerous. Uh, and the result of that is you have you know, many, many millions of dollars going into uh, foundations like the Heritage Institute in uh, foundation in, in Washington, D.C., uh, in which if you do a search, uh, the term climate change almost doesn't appear on their website, but they're advocating enormous buildup of uh, uh, things like aircraft carriers or mm -hmm. missile, missile systems uh, in East Asia, which as far as I know, maybe correct me, have no bearing on climate change. <laughs> So in, in, in that regard, you would consider some of these think tanks more as advocacy groups or even lobbies. Is, is that I, what I, I, I think, think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. there, there are, uh, there's a classic book by uh, James Smith that came out uh, now a couple decades ago called The Idea Brokers, which analyzes the process by which uh, think tanks uh, advocate for particular interest groups. But there's an even more succinct and powerful art, um, paper that was published by People for the American Way called Buying a Movement. And that's a very careful analysis of how various different interest groups uh, have systematically created the illusion of grassroots support for various different policies which don't have any particular support. You also bring them in your article that in this context, many of these think tanks uh, work behind closed doors. 
Why is that and why shouldn't they strive for, for openness? This is a complicated issue, mm. and I don't want to say that there aren't things for which doors should be closed, including this interview right this moment. So uh, I don't want people to think, although there's a risk in writing this article, that I'm for you know, mob rule or that everybody should be there to give their, their, their uh, opinions about trade policy or science policy. Clearly, there's a need for expertise. However, think tanks in Seoul or in D.C. or elsewhere in the world increasingly uh, have been perceived extremely elitist approach, right, mm -hmm. in which you have a sort of a VIP group of people who are always invited and get to go to the dinners uh, and the exclusive seminars. And then there's another sort of, uh, you know, the middle tier who get to have to eat the shrimp at the reception, right? And then there's the, the, the peons who can, you know, the, what we call the, uh, the peanut gallery. I don't know what you say in France <laughs> or in Europe. But the, and those are the people who can show up for the big events, but they don't get to actually meet with the, with the VIPs. So I think this is extremely negative approach to policy discourse, and it's very much degraded, I think, from what we did in the United States. Uh, granted, each country is different, but I know the United States a little better. So in the 1930s and 40s, Roosevelt had a think tank, his cabinet kitchen, in which he invited many intellectuals mm -hmm. uh, there. They, many of them participated not because they wanted to become millionaires, but because they were seriously committed to the, the ideas. Uh, and there was a, a lot of uh, professors in the 50s and 60s in the United States who were involved in policy. And increasingly, the think tank world has moved away from that and more towards uh, self-promotion, uh, much less uh, engagement. People actually know what they're talking about. And East Asia is maybe the worst uh, on the mm. American side. Increasingly, people who couldn't fight their way out of a plastic bag in, in, a, in an Asian language pontificate about what uh, East Asia's future is. Uh, they can't read the languages. They had never spent a lot of time here. Uh, and in many cases, what they say is patently wrong, uh, North Korea being the most uh, obvious case of that. As we like to say, um, getting North Korea wrong is the second oldest profession. Should we actually expect um, privately funded institutes and think tanks, many think tanks are privately funded, mm -hmm. to be neutral? Because after all, if right. you look at an NGO, right. most NGOs are not free of an agenda. Wouldn't even universities be a better place than to look for this nonpartisanship? Yes. I mean, I, I, I would say in my own case, I, I can't speak for the world. I can only give you my own worm's eye view. Uh, from my own case, I would have been perfectly happy to be a professor working at the University of Illinois on Asia policy. But the fact is, or at Kyung Hee or yeah. at other universities in Korea, the fact is that universities are less and less congenial to that sort of discussion. It's universities themselves are being increasingly tracked towards student recruitment, student job placement, tests. Uh, and various different criteria for evaluation, a space in which to have a discussion like we're having today, uh, this is a very serious issue. Hmm. So what we're doing today, this discussion, for a faculty member doesn't serve her or his academic career in any way, right? So or citation public, ranking. <laughs> absolutely not. Well, stuff that, what I write for Huffington Post or Chunang Daily or Foreign Policy and Focus or other places has zero value. Uh, for my evaluation. In fact, the four books, I've now written seven books, only two of them count for anything in terms of my 10-year review. And, and in fact, uh, in a very real way, I'm taking a, a risk. Uh, I don't think it's a serious risk, but it is a risk to say when they do final review for a full professor, Uh, that they can say, well, you didn't publish in these journals, so, uh, you know, I'm sorry, we can't keep you. And that's not just me. That's true for all faculty. So it's, it's increasingly become an environment in which the university is no longer functioning. So I'm not saying universities couldn't do it, but they're not doing it. You mentioned the Heritage Foundation, one yes. of the world's largest think tanks, yes. and, but they do not hide their agenda. Uh, their goal is right. clearly spelled out to right. formulate and promote conservative public policies. It relates a bit to the conversation we just had, but is there anything wrong there? Well, actually, I prefer. <laughs> I prefer the Heritage Foundation because you actually can see in a very transparent way what they're trying to do, which is not always the case. There are some organizations which sort of 
try and make things look uh, somewhat more uh, open-minded than they really are. So if you're going to be advocating for your own interests, uh, it's much preferable that it be transparent, that you know this is what you're advocating for. The question of what's wrong with that, I think there are multiple things wrong with that. First thing is, it comes down to this issue of, of market principles, right? Can, should you make policy based on market? I mean, the person who has more money, do they get more input on policy? And that has been increasingly uh, the case. There was this very humorous article that came out a couple of days ago in the U.S. in which somebody said that uh, maybe rich people should just get more votes. Right? <laughs> Since they have more money, why don't they get more votes? So it makes perfect sense in the logic of Washington. I don't know how serious the article mm-hmm. was, but it was, it was a real article someone and has So written. think tank funders are buying influence uh, in so that, it, in that, that way, that's, yeah. that's undeniable mm-hmm. that, that, that that's what's happening. So I would just say let's go to specific issues and say, what is the agenda for Korea, for the United States, or, or, or for Europe? And I think if we look at it, if we sit down with some experts and say, well, climate change, disparity in, in, uh, of wealth, various different issues with uh, technological evolution and the way it's causing sort of disruptions within institutions, uh, the issue of privatization and the common good, the idea of the, of the commons, these uh, seem to be the essential issues today. Uh, if you went to a, a seminar at Brookings, which is, I guess, mm. quote unquote, liberal, or Heritage, or others, you, or CSIS, you, or, or here in, at the East Asia Institute or ASAN, you would be very hard pressed to find any of these topics uh, even mentioned. Uh, so, from my perspective, or maybe I should say ours, because I'm not unique in the world, to talk about security issues in, in, say, Northeast Asia and not mention climate change is inconscionable, unethical. It's a, not only is it a waste of money, but it's actually uh, counterproductive. Uh, what would it take to, to, to change that? Well, I think it's very dangerous to say we should stop people from advocating, right? Because that's, that's dangerous. I mean, once you say to anybody, well, you can't do this, this is, of course, empowering a sort of counter force. Uh, I don't advocate that. So I agree with your point. Mm. Yes, they have a right to advocate. But I think we better think about this very seriously because climate change, and there's an increasingly number of articles and books coming out of this, this is not a you know, little fun party or mm. something. Uh, and it's totally unprecedented in human history. So it's going to require you to totally rethink everything. So if we have to be sacrificial lambs to say, uh, we're going to do something which is unpopular, sort of politically a mistake. Maybe we should have spent our time talking about North Korea's nuclear program. Well, that's, that's the risk we'll take. Hmm. Playing the devil's advocate a bit, doesn't good research stand on its own regardless of the source or regardless of who's paying? In other, in other words, what does it matter if a think tank has an agenda as long as the, the My- policy an- analysis is sound? To some degree, that's true. Uh, And there is good material produced by any number of think tanks, including places like uh, Heritage or Cato. I I hate the term conservative, and I never use it if I can avoid it because I think it's misleading. But uh, that is true. That that is true. There is good research coming out in different parts uh, from all these organizations. Uh, However, there is a tendency to push within the privatized media and increasingly privatized uh, academic institutions for specific approaches, right? Or, or, so, for example, you run into uh, some economic problems, uh, and the answer that you'll get from the think tank or from the experts is, we have to either raise or lower the interest rate. Now, I, I think this is a ludicrous idea. I, I'm not saying the government can solve problems. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a difficult question how you respond to economic problems. But to say that interest rate is the only sort of calculus by which you can assess a government's approach to economic difficulties, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And think tanks increasingly are doing exactly that. You have some complicated issue, it deserves a broad discussion, and they're giving you a very simplistic answer. North Korea, missile defense. Economic stagnation, lower interest rate, or free trade agreements. But I mean, of course, free trade agreements, uh, I mean, for us, the more interesting question is, what does free trade mean? (laughs) Why do you trade? What does trade do? How does it work? 
not an anti-trade position, just you know, get into the sort of the, the bowels of the, of the issue. Uh, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of room for think tanks. You also criticize that think tanks need to become uh, more multilingual. Yes. It's always in English, but why not use English then? I mean, it includes more people than any other language could. Um, mm. Aren't you de facto excluding people from the debate if you're writing in other languages, for example, in, in Vietnamese or in Right, Indian? right. The article I wrote on that subject was specifically about the issue of climate change. So I was talking specifically, if you want to change policy decisions, say in Vietnam, then you have to prepare materials in Vietnamese that the Vietnamese government can use. Otherwise, your impact is going to be very limited. And this has been a serious problem. If you go to the many sites for think tanks working on global issues, they've invested a lot of money in like shrimp at cocktail parties, but they have very little material on their websites in any other language than English. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is just uh, wrong-headed because if you don't provide materials that their local governments or, or, or national governments can actually sort of cut and paste into national policy, then your impact is very limited. But on the other question about, say, English versus Chinese, there are more native speakers of Chinese than there are of English. Uh, and increasingly, China is impacting the entire global economy uh, and the environment, the biosphere. So I would say a major investment in getting materials out in Chinese aimed at a Chinese audience should be a high priority for any think tank dealing in international relations. Let's zoom in a bit on Korea. One of the think tanks you bring up in your article, and arguably the most famous one uh, in Korea, is the Asan Institute, founded in 2008. On its website, it describes itself as independent, nonpartisan, and has for goal to create an environment for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. So where is the issue there from your perspective? Does the problem lie in the mission statement or is the reality that Asan Institute does not live up to the mission? Why, why did you criticize them? Uh, some of my best friends are at Asan Institute and uh, I'm very thankful for the broad range of people they bring through and they have had some very excellent uh, seminars which I have attended. So it's not a blanket criticism, but I think uh, if we look at Asan in terms of who they select to come and the agenda for the discussion, it's extremely, extremely limited. And in the United States, they've engaged basically the far right. I mean, uh, people like former Vice President Cheney and uh, Rumsfeld. I mean, basically a, a very distinct group who deserve a voice, but who definitely don't represent the United States. So that was very disappointing. But I think maybe more importantly, uh, there was an incident with the Asan Institute where they recently had a plenum. I had a personal experience, right? So they sent me an invitation and I told my friends about it. I forwarded and then they tried to write and say they wanted to go to the event and they were told that only special people who were invited were allowed to go to the plenum. Were you invited to the plenum, by the way? Uh, no. Right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so only an elite group of special people. And so I responded to that by saying... I wanted my name taken off of their mailing list because I don't want to attend any events which are only for special people. I, I came to feel that this was just not the right paradigm. I welcome a more open uh, Asan Institute uh, and uh, I would love to, I've proposed uh, to work together with Asan Institute explicitly. Mm. I would be happy to do that. So you mentioned that you and some colleagues of your own institute have participated in uh, events organized by Asan. Yes. So if Asan is a place where policy is not debated, but rather explaining what has already been decided, to quote mm -hmm. your article, then aren't you actively taking part in that process in a way? Right. So this is a very legitimate point. Uh, and as we learn, in the, if you're interested in governance and policy, you'll learn uh, that you become part of the problem as soon as you start to actually try and do something. So the criticism is a legitimate one. Uh, and there's clearly, I have my own vision for what I think should be done, me and other people at Asian Institute and other organizations. And we are advocating for what we think is a uh, important and often ignored aspects of security, international relations, trade and politics. That's entirely true. And mm. we want to be transparent about that. We have our perspective. However, uh, Asian Institute has a you know, yearly budget of, say, $20,000 or something like that, which is probably uh, what most uh, institutes spend on one uh, event. Uh, and uh, we 
we believe very strongly that money is not a determining factor in terms of policy. I, I run into this issue all the time. I had, yesterday I met with a high-level uh, government official. Uh, we talked about Asian Institute, and his first question to me was, what's your budget and who funds you? Mm. Uh, I wanted to talk about <laughs> what are ideas? <laughs> what are we trying to advocate for? What are our vision? But uh, that is a very much a reality uh, of how things have been done in the United States, in Korea, and elsewhere. Uh, but I think that's a, it's a dead-end paradigm, and I think it's going to change. I think it's going to change. We singled out the Asan Institute. No, not, uh, that was not me. That was yeah, not me. Um, I think the next question should be, are there any other think tanks in Korea that you see in similar situations, and maybe uh, also with a similar right, ecosystem, right. let's say? Right. So I, I really hesitate to, to get into... Uh, uh, evaluation of, of think tanks. All of them have potential. ASAN, I'm very grateful for many of the programs they, they have run and they have been very kind enough to invite me to. But I guess on the other sort of spectrum, when we have things, for example, like the Tamil Yonde, the People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy, or the Korean Federation of for environmental movements, sort of more the progressive think tank world, and there are Noksek Chipyong Green Horizon, another think tank working on environmental issues, do extremely uh, uh, valuable work. There is a say a broad range, but there has been a tendency in terms of the the global aspects of it for you know Asan and East. But there's traditional KDI, Sejong. There, mm. there, there's a group of these think tanks out there, they play a, we want an ecosystem, that's the word you used a moment ago. So an ecosystem, you have giraffes and elephants, right? But you also have uh, ants and uh, salamanders and all sorts of other uh, animals in a very diverse group. So I'm not anti-elephant, elephants are great for what they do, but we need a, a more diverse uh, group. Uh, and specifically, we have to have one in which we can engage young people because I think young people are often really left out of that mm. policy process. In your article, you criticized that liberal think tanks in Seoul offer critical perspectives on contemporary policy, which is good, mm -hmm. but they fail to present an argument that will appeal to an international audience. Yes. The reasons for that, you argue, are that the, their research is rarely available in languages other than Korean. Mm -hmm and they have few international partners. But the question, I guess, could be, if they are focused on domestic issues, why should liberal think tanks have to bother translating everything into English, since probably the international community would not have any direct role in influencing domestic politics? Well, I, I guess I, I feel that the institutions I mentioned, Korean Federation of Environmental Movement, for example, produce uh, materials which is very relevant internationally, not just in Korea by any means. And Korean policy, domestic policy on, say, energy and development, infrastructure, affects the rest of the world. I mean, the Four Rivers Project is linked to Korean overseas uh, projects for development. And so I, I think they're inseparable. I, I don't think that Korean domestic politics or domestic policy can be detached from the development of the world. Uh, so my criticism is not just for uh, mainstream or conservative think tanks, I want it to be balanced. Uh, and, and criticism is not my main point, although it seems to be the most trenchant part of my article, that uh, the so-called progressive uh, think tanks, there are two problems. One is many so-called progressive organizations in Korea tend to emphasize a sort of ethno-nationalist uh, perspective. Koreans, Koreans as opposed to the globalists, uh, corporations, uh, and they tend to not be so interested in a sort of in-depth presentation of their ideas for an international audience. And I think that's a mistake. And, and I would, I think I could, I could write a whole article of criticism on that point as well. And I was very saddened. I mean, I worked, I was a member of, uh, I am a member of Korean Federation of Environmental Movements. I was on their international relations committee for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was disappointed that they didn't develop better engagement with various different institutions around the world. They didn't put more effort into translating and getting their materials out. Uh, many foreigners, all they know is, is ASAN. So that's great, but ASAN is not Korea by any means. You run your own uh, institution, the Asia Institute. What's the ambition behind it and what is uh, your mission? You already mentioned the importance of climate change, but... Right, right. So the Asian Institute, I started with a group of people 
originally in Daejeon in 2007. And uh, there are three themes, I would say. The overarching purpose is to talk about important issues that are not being treated by other major think tanks, and maybe also to treat them in a, in a, in a manner uh, that is visible for the more conservative mainstream think tanks. That's to say, not to take a particularly strident, uh, trenchant, sort of liberal progressive uh, uh, tone, but to talk about these issues in a way that anybody from an international relations, security, diplomacy background would say, well, this sounds reasonable, right? Not, not to have the sort of anti-establishment sort of bias in, in, our, in our tone. So the three issues, environment, climate change, technological change, and evolving aspects of international relations. To so say mm. these are three uh, related issues, and we tend not to put them together very well, and we wanted to sort of emphasize that this sort of, this triad, this triangle is where our focus should be. Your think tank focuses more than others on the youth. Yes. And in your article, you argue for the involvement of young people, including high school and college students, right. in planning seminars, research projects. Um, and in, you wrote, we should make it easy for committed youth to get funding to start their own think tanks mm -hmm. and to use those think tanks to promote their ideas. If young people would shape the agenda, where do you think it would differ from what think tanks around the world, and especially in Korea, are doing today? And wouldn't actually many young people be interested in so-called conservative areas or ideas, international finance, security? So I'm not going to presume that I know what young people would advocate. However, I would say that there's, a, there's potentially a profound difference, and that in the case of Korea, although it's true in, in the United States and Europe as well, uh, we have a very serious sort of a, um, demographic issue of an aging population. And of course, in the United States and Europe, it's maybe a little bit less visible because of the immigration. Uh, but if you strip the immigration away, in terms of families that have been there, say, for over 50 years, we're essentially the same as Korea. The only difference is that Korea just hasn't permitted, or Japan and Korea haven't, haven't permitted this degree of immigration. Mm. So the risk of this, and it's a very serious one, is you have a small group of older people focused on issues which are important to older people with relatively myopic policy perspective. And I see this everywhere. So we have in health, massive investment in treating uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, very little interest in diseases which affect young people, very little concern about sustainable economic systems for welfare and jobs out past five years, but profound interest in you know, their own security for people over 50. So I think it's extremely serious. There, there have been several articles and books written in the United States about what they call sort of the war on children, essentially to say that children are being victimized by increasingly self-centered, narcissistic, older generation. So I see it as a serious problem. Whether young people see it as a serious problem or not, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I personally have cast my lot with mm. young people. Uh, not to say that we'll be successful, uh, but I think that if you have young people, and I, when I young people, I say even down to high school, high school, college, young, say from like 15 to 25, 30, that these people uh, should have a seat at the discussion and they should have a major input on policy. And I think in the United States and Korea, they have a minimal uh, minimal opportunities. But do you believe that students, and I think high school students uh, in particular, would be able to provide meaningful and relevant projects if granted the resources to start their own think tank? Wouldn't such inexperienced researchers, right. so to speak, you know, would actually be more likely to repeat all the platitudes <laughs> that we can sometimes uh, find in, 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 you know, established policy papers that we get from think tanks? Uh, this is clearly uh, an issue. And in fact, I had a project at Asia Institute to do seminars regularly with just high school students in Korean, uh, and it didn't really work the way I would have <laughs> liked it to. So uh, I think it's, it's a complicated issue. So I'm offering in that article sort of an idea to say this is something we could do because most young people, say in their high school, well, let me put it this way. 
I'm throwing something out there to start a discussion, and I'm imagining among high school students, I met a lot, I've done a lot of programs with high school students, and one in 20, one in 50, one in 100 are really interested and they have serious ideas. And it's much better for them to be thinking, how could I start a think tank than to think about, you know, plastic surgery or idol singers. I mean, it, it has the potential to at least improve the prospects for young people in terms of being able to think about the world and their role in it. And if you start in a primitive, not particularly effective think tank when you're in high school, it at least sets the, the, the precedent for it's It's the same as democracy, right? If your school elects people to be chairman when you're in high school or in elementary school and you practice that, then it sets a precedent for democratic process, right? Which you will carry on whether you're working for a corporation or working in government or NGOs or whatever. If you never have any participatory activities until you graduate from college, right? And then suddenly someone said, oh, well, you can vote for president. Well, it's democracy in only the most limited sense. It's not really a democratic society because you don't have any democratic experience in your practice. So I personally think that if we try to encourage people in high school uh, to engage in, in debates, have think tanks, talk about policy, give their ideas, and think that people were listening to them that actually meant something, this would be quite positive. One interesting point you make uh, concerns sole potential as a center for think tanks. First of all, what does that mean? A large number of think tanks? Is it you know purely in terms of the demographics of think tanks? So there are already an increasing mm. number of think tanks in Seoul. Uh, and I guess maybe I see that from the perspective of coming from Washington, D.C. I was there for two years before I came to Korea, uh, and I was very disappointed at the, the lack of diversity of perspective. So by comparison, uh, Seoul is good. Uh, there are more different groups with different perspectives. Unfortunately, they tend to be in Korean, uh, but I found the diversity to be refreshing in a relative sense of what I found mm. in Washington. Uh, moreover, Korea has the potential to have much more impact than, say, Washington, D.C., because Koreans interact with Vietnamese, Mongolians, Uzbeks, all sorts of different groups which have close working level relationships in terms of technology, policy, infrastructure. Uh, and so Korea's potential impact throughout the world is in terms of think tanks, ideas, policy directions is larger. Seoul's potential impact is larger than Washington's. In what sense does Seoul share the necessary uh, preconditions with existing think tank centers? To take the, again the example of Washington, the city is, is infamous for its revolving doors. Yeah. So you have people transferring from policy circles to academic and research institutions to private right. businesses. One can criticize that, but obviously it also fosters this whole ecosystem. And doesn't Seoul at least currently work in a very different, more compartmentalized way? Right. Korea has its clear limitations, perhaps the most profound limitation has been the emphasis in Korean developmental strategy on ethno-nationalistic, so we Koreans mm -hmm. will do this, and that that has undermined the ability of Koreans to present a universal perspective, to say this is for the sake of people, not just for Korea. I see that changing over the last, say, 10 years. Uh, but I'm not saying Korea is not there yet. What I'm suggesting is, in terms of infrastructure, diverse first. Let's start from the basement up. Very high level, most PhDs probably of any major capital in the world. Uh, diversity in terms of technology, you know, knowledge of different fields of technology, international relations, and, and also the humanities. Very good a diversity of people who speak Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, and English here. We can, if you want to find a city where you can find that sort of group, I think Seoul's the only city hmm. like that. A lot of engagement, people with experience working in Africa, in Vietnam, in Central Asia, regional areas of China. You don't find that sort of expertise in, in Washington, D.C. You just don't, American doesn't have corporations anymore that become financialized. We don't actually build things. I mean, that's exaggeration, but mm. it's much more true that Koreans have a sort of hands-on understanding of how infrastructure, how technology, how policy works in countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand. Americans te has tend to be more financialized, and so uh, Korea is strong in that. Seoul is strong in that respect. 
Critical Voices might argue that Korea has been pushing itself as a hub for just about everything in the past decade. Free trade, green growth, of course, the whole development story of Korea. Why do you think Korea might succeed precisely in this area? Right. I'm not... I'm in Seoul, so mm. I obviously have an interest in promoting Seoul, and this is where we've chosen because we thought it was the best place to be. I do not want to take the position that Seoul is the inevitable center for all think tanks to come to. It's not a mecca in that sense. My article is rhetorical. Mm. My article is rhetorical. If another city is willing to do so and build that sort of a center, then, you know, uh, best of luck, I, I fully support that. I have found that compared with the capitals that I know, Washington, D.C., Tokyo, where I lived for six years, or Beijing, which I have never lived in, but I spent a lot of time in, they all have potential. But if I had to evaluate them based in terms of the level of education, diversity of experience, and the, the major universities, and, and, and the, the, the corporations, the major global corporations, Korea has the foundations that are required, and a degree of sort of ideological, cultural flexibility that you don't find in those mm. other capitals. So that's, that's, I guess, the reason why I said Seoul. What steps should be taken for Seoul to become this new think tank mecca, to reuse that expression? Um, and <laughs> I'm going to regret guess, that one. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess the question should also be who is going to fund it? Oh, should it be yes. a public or a private endeavor? Right, right. Well, both. I, I found the city of Seoul uh, under uh, uh, Mayor Park won sun has done a lot, actually, to encourage discussions, think tank-like events. So I, I think this, the city government has, has been very, very supportive and very supportive of Asia Institute. We're incorporated, actually, through the, the uh, Department of Education of the city of Seoul. So uh, we found the city of Seoul government to be extremely supportive for our efforts, uh, and there's an enormous amount of, of potential there. And the city of Seoul has been engaged in many very innovative approaches. You probably, this is another interview, but uh, <laughs> uh, Seoul City has shown a considerable interest, both in Asia Institute and innovative approaches. The mayor, as you know, started as a think tanker. He started two major think tanks here in Korea, and he's continued to work with major think tanks uh, not the mainstream uh, ones that we've mentioned, but this has been a very much a part of his, his vision for the city of Seoul. To conclude, Professor Pastreich, are you optimistic about where we are going in terms of governance? You mentioned new technologies like the internet, which may help us solve some of the problems that we talked about. Or do you see think tanks and public deliberation actually going even further in the wrong direction through this new type of communication and potentially uh, recreating existing inequalities? Right. So, yes is the answer to your question. Both, both are true, and uh, our purpose, our agenda, is just to look at what, what is possible, that think tanks could play this role, and to present to people a sort of an alternative paradigm. It's beyond our capacity to try and get other people to stop doing it. It's, It's much easier to, to modify what your own behavior, <laughs> to tell other people to change their behavior, uh, is a, a bit of a stretch. Professor Pastreich, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.